The talk we're going to discuss in our little discussion section here is karma and self-responsibility. Uh, it's a big topic, karma and self-responsibility, because they sort of go hand in hand. And it goes a lot hand in hand with a little bit life purpose as well and free will. So we'll talk about those concepts. A good resource for this information, or there's lots of lots of books that talk about karma, but I, I quite like the Alice Bailey series, and there's a book called Esoteric Healing, which is a really good book that describes uh, a lot of things related to healing and self, and because karma is a big topic in relation to what contributes to our own health or well-being or our illnesses, it's very in-depth. It's like one of five books on the raise. So there's a, they're not easy to read, the Alice Bailey books, but they're very, very profound and very, very deep. And as your awareness gets deeper and you get more integrated, you can read it over and over and get more and more out of it every single time. I'll write that in, in the list of references at the end. So I'll come back to some of this. But the main thing I wanted to start with, with this is we're talking about karma. Now there's many different types of karma. Karma is basically, you could look at it as simply a law of self-responsibility. But the trouble is to understand responsibility you really need to understand the anatomy or what makes up our whole being okay you can't just look at it from a purely physical perspective there's lots of different ways you can look at karma but you have to have a sort of a bit of an understanding or some sort of basic knowledge of self and the deeper the knowledge of self the more you get an, a way of looking at the more understanding you get of the whole picture and the more you can see the whole picture the more you can be very conscious of our life choices and whether those life choices are in harmony with our inner health and well-being or out of harmony with our inner health being so and well-being if we're in sync with our own inner health and well-being and we're drawing energies universal energies through ourselves into their natural expression that will manifest as health and if you do things for the greater good not just for your own self but for the benefit of all you technically don't really create any in, in individual karma, it's all done for the collective greater good. So there's good karma, there's bad karma, there's all sorts of different sorts of karma. So if we talk a little bit about this little diagram on the left the picture here, this is sort of a, a chart of the multidimensional self. Now I'm not going to go into that multidimensional self. Now I'm just going to point out a couple of general elements. So you can think of our whole self as having two major divisions. There's the what you might call the higher self, which I've depicted here. There's this triangle here, which is spirit, intuitive, and the higher mind. That's often called the spiritual tri triad or formless. So we're going to just consider that for now as our, our higher self. And then you've got the lower self, which is the personality. And the personality represents our lower mind, emotions, and our bodies. Okay, so you've got these two elements. Now, you could say, for the purposes of this discussion that the higher element of ourself is that inner healthy blueprint it's the part of us which is always connected to our to the universal data banks to the whole to the source okay and it's sort of one with everything and then the lower self is more the personalities are the the, the vehicles that we operate through in day-to-day -day life and so they almost got these two different elements it's a higher and the lower. Now, the soul is considered to dwell in the in between on the higher mind. So in humanity, you have you know higher elements of self, lower elements of self, and then there's the consciousness, the self-awareness. So when we come into being, into incarnation, and we travel in our journey through life, this is what's depicted by these pictures here on the left. So you've got this little picture at the bottom here is physical man and has an awareness of himself as a physical body. Then you've got emotional man, uh, mental man, and then as we develop in our awareness of consciousness and life experience, we start to tap into, you can say, we start to grow up and tap into, you might say, uh, uh, make a connection with our higher divine self, which is always plugged into the universe. But we do that consciously. So we've got this consciousness element that starts to develop and understand the relationship between our higher nature which is our god nature and our lower nature you could look at it like that and we come into incarnation we have free will to choose 
our path and free will to experience our path and grow. Now, the trouble is when we come in and participate in life, our awareness is not really conscious of all this. This is all happening behind the scenes. These are things we can become aware of with practice, meditation, spiritual development, all that sort of stuff. So you could imagine, for example, that, you know, when we're in the world, we can sometimes get attached to it. Okay. And when we're attached to the world, attached to objects, attached to emotions, attached to ideas and beliefs, that can get us into trouble if those beliefs or those attachments distract us from our ideal healthy alignment. So I've tried to depict that here on the right of the diagram. This is like a timeline diagram. If you imagine that the dawn of time and space, we are a spiritual spark. We're sort of this sort of uh, newborn spiritual being and we come into incarnation and we're traveling along, you might say an ideal timeline, okay? So then you get to a point here in the diagram where there's a trauma of some sort. Now, I said that karma is the law of self-responsibility. So if we get to a trauma and we stay plugged in and we just experience that trauma and don't react to it, and we remember our source and we just learn from it, we don't attach in our body any negative or overactive or underactive response to that event, okay? So if we respond inappropriately or react inappropriately to that event, it sort of like deviates us from our timeline and creates like a memory of an issue, creates an issue in our system. And that issue, if you bring it to the present, could manifest down the track as, for example, a heart issue, for example, in this case here, okay? So that problem in the heart originated back in time somewhere where we had a reaction to a trauma, which let's say it's an um, emotional trauma or an abuse or something like that or a relationship problem and by attaching ourselves to the reaction to that problem we've held that pattern in our body so that's a sense of karma in operation because if we we've basically our caused that issue in ourselves, and it's manifested eventually in the body as a physical health issue okay so regardless of what someone else does to us our reaction to that event can cause a problem so i'll give you an example if you think about it here, let's say this person, let's say this is me or you, and we're traveling along and we get into a relationship conflict or imbalance with a partner. Now, let's say that partner says to us, you are a worthless, useless human being. You're good for nothing and you're not gonna achieve anything good in life, okay? So that statement is actually a negative statement. It's not a very supportive statement. It's not very healthy. And there is a karma associated with projecting an error. It's a lie. It's not really even true. If someone projects an untruth onto us, that is what they're responsible for. And if they keep doing that sooner or later, that projection of a faulty belief system or an imposed issue is going to catch up with them and come back as a health issue or a trauma or an incident or an accident somewhere in the future. So that's their responsibility. So we could say, we could sit here and say, well, that's not our problem. That's not my responsibility. And we can blame them for attacking us or for forcing us to do something against our will or for uh, abusing us or whatever. But you've got to remember that it's two ways. If we allow ourselves to believe that faulty belief system. So in other words, if we say, all right, I believe you, I'm useless, I'm worthy, unworthy, I'm a terrible human being and we believe that, that means we're believing an error projected on us from somebody else. That error means it's gonna undermine our confidence, it's gonna create a health issue in our system because our system starts to react and um, it starts to play out a faulty belief system and that's also gonna catch up with us in the future, okay, and create some sort of a health issue. So the lesson there is we're not owning our power, we're allowing ourselves to buy into someone else's agenda and we're believing an untruth. So you could say there are two reasons we can get into trouble. One, where we project an illusion or an untruth onto somebody else. Or two, if we accept an illusion or an untruth in ourselves. Both of those will create a reaction to things as they actually are and lead to health issues down the track. Okay? And it's going to have consequences because if you don't deal with that and own your power, you're going to constantly be 
bullied and, and pushed down and suppressed till you've got no self-worth left at all. So that's one example. That's putting in a very, very simple terminology. So I hope that makes some sense. So that comes back to, oh, we'll come back to that in a minute. So in this circumstance here, that person, by taking on an illusion and being attached to that, attached to a faulty premise, we've basically attached ourselves to an issue. So this is, this is what I've depicted here in this, this picture here, the bucket of the personality. So here's a person who, the midline here, if they're staying true to themselves and they're experiencing life without reacting to it, they will stay healthy and express health. But when we start to take on a faulty belief system, our consciousness is drawn into that belief system. And this is not always necessarily negative belief system. Sometimes people are doing things for the right reason, but the error they're making is they're forcing on other people so that to do what they want them to do and not letting them learn in their own way. Okay, So it could be sometimes we can get attached to positive things and that can that will bring good karma but i'll come back to that in a little while so the idea here is the consciousness gets attached or enslaved by attachment to beliefs emotions or objects to the point where it distracts us from our own life energy and the more distracted we get the more the imbalance becomes built up in our system so you can think of that as putting more muck in the buckets of our personalities okay now if we keep filling ourselves up with errors and illusions and trapped emotions and faulty belief systems and or rigid belief systems and attached objects sooner or later that the health is going to be diminished the health is sort of the bucket gets more and more accumulated with debris and the health that's within gets literally smothered and suppressed okay so if you imagine this bucket is 50 51 percent full of rubbish and only 49% of health. Now you've got a person who's got probably more of a chronic health issue and they are manifesting more disease than health. So you can turn that around because all you have to do to turn that around is use your awareness to tap into the light within, the health within, and start feeding the health and not the problem, starving the problem. So if you direct, if you tune into what's healthy on any level, you can thread your way back to the source again, you come back to a healthy blueprint and then you let that flow through the bucket and clear away the muck. So in a sense, responsibility, in order to be responsible and to understand to how to heal, you've got to be aware of the problem, aware of the faulty belief system or the emotion. This is what the goal of our meditation is, to become aware of the health in our body and the disease. You detach your consciousness from the disease and plug it back into health, okay? When you plug it back into health, you are feeding the health in your system, a healthy system, more life energy. And then you can flow through that life energy, through the healthy connection, back into the problem and surround it so it can't take you over. And then you start to clear that karmic debris out of the bucket. So it's like pouring more clear water into the bucket of the personality, flushing the muck out. And as you flush the problem out, that will come up to the subconscious. Stuff that's been stored and trapped within our system will come up to the consciousness. And at that point, when that happens in modern day society, because modern day society is avoiding responsibility for healing, when something comes up and doesn't feel very comfortable, people aren't going to like that. So what do they do because of the modern culture? They run to the doctor and get a pill to suppress that symptom from coming up. But that's only going to push muck back into the bucket and put it below the threshold so that you're not actually feeling just uncomfortable anymore. You're feeling pacified, but it's not actually healing because you haven't cleared any muck out of the bucket at all. So that muck, well, when it goes in, it's quite traumatic. When it comes out, it's also traumatic. But the difference is when you're healing is that the muck is coming out of the bucket, not going in. So if you're able to tune in, you will feel more health and vitality building in your body. And I call that the health disease ratio so if you are you know 49 percent healthy and 51 percent dysfunctional and you pour in more health you might become 51 percent healthy and 49 percent dysfunctional that means that you're starting to clear now obviously there's more muck to clear but every time you do a little healing you clear, clear a little bit of more of that muck clear a bit more muck out of the bucket and you'll come out at a higher percentage of health 
which you will feel in your being as a greater sense of unity, integration, symmetry, healthy feeling, and healthy flow and function. Okay, that manifests in the body. So that's how you know if you're getting better or worse. So if you get, if you have issues coming up in your life and you're sitting there blaming everybody for those issues without actually tuning in, you might come across people, for example, who are really loving and supporting and they're spreading love and support to you. But that love and support supports the health, which flushes into your problems and brings your problem up and makes you feel uncomfortable which you can then project onto them and say, you're making me feel uncomfortable. That is the wrong interpretation of that scenario. And because if we don't tune in and feel it, what that means is we're blaming someone else for making us uncomfortable, which is possibly true, but it's not for the right reason. They're making us uncomfortable because their health is like um, diffusion. They're overflowing health onto us. It flows in and brings our issues up. If we could tune in, we'd say, actually, I feel you're sending me love and support and that support is filling my being up and is flushing my own issues up. Thanks for doing that. And then you let it go through and clear and you'll come up out feeling healthier when it's all over. So when the issue comes up, that's like the storm comes up, like a ship sailing through the storm. You have to hold your attention and consciousness steady and wait for the hold on to the health, surround the problem and wait till it starts to flush up and clear. And when the storm's over, it clears and everything settles down. It feels like it releases and you get a healthier rhythm. And this is what we're talking about every week in our meditations. We're coming at the end of our meditations. We're, we're going through that storm. We're coming out the other side. And I don't let go until the whole system feels like it's flowing clear and it's a little bit more lifted. Now, that doesn't mean we're perfect. It means that we've right, risen our health disease ratio a little bit more health which clears a lot of our buckets of our personality, clears our karmic debris and helps us move forward into the present and future from a healthier perspective. Now, karma is a little bit like if you put rubbish in your bucket, you're responsible for that rubbish. It, you're no one else is responsible for it. They might have triggered it, but you're responsible for either reacting or responding to that situation in the best possible way. Okay. So as you get more conscious, you can start responding to even the worst situations from a healthy perspective. I always say the soul responds, the personality reacts. So you might get in an argument with somebody. I use this analogy a lot. And you just say you're in a, an argument with a, a partner and you're, you're trying to express your truth and you feel really centered and balanced and you express your truth and you say everything and do all the right things, but you lose the argument. They don't get the message but you stay centered and you stay healthy and you stay tuned in and you're in your own power. Now, you may not have got what you want, but you've actually been true to yourself. You've expressed yourself. And even though you didn't win the conversation or get what you want, you, you've done the best you can and that tells you you're on the right track. Now, the reverse situation could happen. You could start a conversation coming from the right place, really balanced, really centered, really clear. You can talk to your partner and you can manipulate them into getting what you want, okay, at their expense. If you manipulate someone to get what you want, when you tune into your own system, you will find that you might win the argument and get what you want, but you've lost your center in the process. If you lose your center in that process, that means that you've actually manipulated that, that person against their will to get what you want at their expense. So it's actually win-lose. You get what you want, but they don't get what they want. So when you're looking at karma, it's about balance, okay? It's about the right control of life energies. It's the correct use of energy, not the misuse of energy. If you use energy correctly and you understand the energy flow and forces, you will only use that energy for everyone's good, including your own. So it's win-win. And that's how you know You'll interact with people, you'll come through the conversation or the interaction or the challenge, the life challenge. And some life challenges are very, very difficult, like we're going through at the moment in the world with the conflicts and the manipulation that's going on in the world. But if you can stay plugged in and centered and healthy in your nature, you will come out and not create any negative karma from that process. And if you put health into your buckets of personality now, that health has to manifest at some point in the future because energy follows thought. If health goes in, health will come out, but it will 
play out in time. So when we're going through challenges in the moment, in the now, that often, and we've done everything right, and we still have issues in the moment, that usually means that at some point in the past, we've put muck in our buckets, and that muck is getting flushed out in the present to manifest now. So this is why a lot of people who, who are eating the right foods, doing exercise, they're treating others with love and respect, they're doing all the right things, and they're still having health issues. And then they might interpret that as, well, I must be doing something wrong. Uh, and therefore they change, try and change and do something else. They sort of make it up. But if you could tune in and tap into that inner energy, you would find that, hang on, everything's actually clear in there. It's just that stuff that's already been in there is coming out and that's clearing our past karma. So I hope that makes some sense. So it's about the correct use of energies. So I'll just go back to this picture for a second. I oh, know we'll go back, we'll, we'll talk about this picture. So it's always related to the use and uh, direction of energy, life energy. Okay, so the key to balancing is right control of life energy, the correct use. And to do that, you need to understand the energy body, the energy centers. You need to look at the different levels of our being the soul, the mind, the emotions. And if all of them are in alignment, it flows, the health will flow to our outer self, our personality, our body, and create a healthy, strong body. Now, another thing, this is talking, I'm sort of intertwining karma here with responsibility and the use of energy. There's two ways we can use energy. We can, another two ways we can look at it. We can either overdo something or underdo something. So I'll give you another example. So if you're a person in life who's so over-focused on work and, and activities and just you just go, 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 you've got a lot of energy, okay? A lot of energy running through the system. And you're always running, you know, let's say you're not in the moment, you're ahead of yourself, you've got 10 or 12 projects on the go at once and you never stop to rest. That means that when you, even, when you do stop to rest physically, because the mind is very overactive and very over busy, you're not actually resting. The mind is still thinking ahead of what it's got to do next. So there are some people that are that busy that even when they lie down to rest, their mind is still busy. They're not getting rest. They've got, they're in overactive mode. Now, because it's, because it's all about balance, the, it's not hard to predict that if you keep running a lot of energy through your system, but you're never resting and recuperating, you're gonna suffer from illnesses of excess. Okay, you could get run down and then, then you hit the wall, you have to have a rest, you're forced to have a rest. You might get a cold or a flu, is it because the cold and flu, cold, when people get colds, for example, that's not a negative thing. Usually it happens because we're run down and it's a way our systems can reboot and rebalance. In other words, it's the system saying, slow down, tune in, recoup, clear, and if you tune in and heal, you'll actually come out more healthy and healed after the cold than before. So that's often a, a natural process of clearing. But what do we do in the modern world? We run off to the doctor to get a pill to suppress the cold. And then a lot of the time, a lot of the things that we're doing in modern day medical practice, it's all very symptom based, it's all very satisfy the ego, satisfy the personality. And that's this issue here on the right of this diagram. We're feeding the ego and we're giving it satisfaction, we're giving it what it wants, but we're not fulfilling the inner need and staying aligned. So as you get more aware, you don't judge life by win or lose or get what you want or not, you judge it by how well you stay aligned and in sync with your between your higher and your lower elements, okay, consciously or unconsciously. So that's the idea. So we either have an excess. So there are some people who get issues with excess. So some physical examples might be when someone overuses a particular part of their body, let's say they're working, um, you know, a, a gardener and they're always shoveling with the same side all the time. They're compressing one side of the body and stretching the other. Usually it's the overworked muscles and ligaments and tissues that get painful, not the parts that are stuck. If your nervous system is overactive and your sympathetic nervous system is overactive, you're always in fight, flight, fight mode. So that sends the blood and the circulation to the limbs and to the heart and lungs to get more oxygen and energy in so you can do what you want to do. But your resting and digestive system, which needs to relax, to digest and rest and excrete and relax, the parasympathetic system, 
gets inhibited and so you end up could end up with digestive issues so what i'm sort of trying to do is show you that a lot of the problems we get in day-to-day -day life irritable bowel digestive issues overuse of areas breakdown arthritis degeneration that are all the result of uneven weight bearing or uneven forces on the body or energies that eventually wreaking havoc either in an overactive way or a deficiency way if you have a person for example who sits on the couch uh, drinks beer all the time eats really bad food they never exercise they never stretch and what's going to happen is they're not doing anything haven't got enough or more motive in their body so they're going to end up with health issues of deficiency okay which means they're going to get they might get uh, overweight they might get sluggish they might get um, very congested and they could end up with lymphatic issues congested heart issues fluid issues in the body and and so forth and, and poor absorption and bowel issues from congestion or constipation so they're basically suffering from issues of deficiency and so what is all that but self-responsibility so when you look at that instead of the person saying all right is this healthy for me? Is this actually going to do me good? They'll, they'll just say, oh, they expect, they might sort of say, no, I'm entitled to sit there and do nothing and have no problems. And I'll just run to the doctor to get a pill or I'll expect everyone else to serve me and look after me and we never do anything on my own. So if you use a little bit of logic, it's pretty clear that all the health issues we get in our system, and I haven't even got onto accidents yet, are a result of either overactivity or underactivity. So when something happens in our system, in our nature, and we tune in and look inside, we can ask ourselves the questions, are we overdoing it or underdoing it or both? When we get a health issue, what we should be doing is tuning in, listening to our body, plugging into that part of our system that's healthy, and also noticing where we're struggling, where we're, where we're attached, where we're stuck, surround the problem areas in health, and then we work through to clear that inner system flush the muck out of our buckets, regenerate the system, bring in more energy, healthy energy, more balance. And then over time, as we clear the buckets of muck, we get increasingly healthier and our immune system and our vascular system and our neural health all gets healthier. And then eventually, we, that starts to play out in life. It starts to happen. I've seen, for example, I remember a lady I saw with rheumatoid arthritis. That's an autoimmune issue. Uh, it's a chronic issue, it's a, sort of a long-term health issue. And when I first started seeing her, for quite a few treatments, you know, the first four or five treatments over a period of time, of course, over time, she tend, seemed to be getting worse and more difficult and uh, more problematic. But if you tune into her health in her body, her health was getting brighter and more healthy. And then as her health started to kick in and the problem started to flush out, over time, her treatments extended out from months to two months to three months until she basically hardly needed to come in at all. And I remember bumping into her at the gym one day and she hadn't had any health issues, any trouble with her, her, arthritis, her rheumatoid arthritis for probably six, six or seven months uh, since I saw her the last time. Because as she got healthier and she cleared away her you know, health issues, her system naturally got healthier in the future. She put in health in, in the treatment in the present. She did the right things. She looked after herself. She tuned in, she meditated, she ate better, she exercised and her system gradually got clearer and she didn't, wasn't reliant or needing as many treatments in the end. So that's exactly how it works. I've seen that happen with a lot of chronic health clients. You start treating them and a lot of their issues start coming up. But because of the modern emphasis in the world on physical health, the trouble with that is a lot of people try and do physical things to resolve it, but most of these chronic health issues aren't physical. They're all, if you tune into this whole personality, you will find that a lot of the issues are psychological and they're related to the past. So they're related to old traumas and issues and reaction patterns that have been set up in the past. Maybe they had a really traumatic childhood Maybe they've had a lot of accidents. Maybe they've had just a hard time of it. And they've then life has basically been dumping on them the whole life. And eventually got to the point where they have a chronic health issue and their health to disease ratio is more disease than there is health. And when you've got more problems over overwhelming the health, 
it takes a long time to build the health to the point where the person's healthier than they are problematic. Once you get over the hill, however, everything starts to get easier. It starts to get easier to clear. And this is the thing in society we've got at the moment, which is not really happening on a, except by a very few practitioners in every possible field. Those practitioners that are really looking after health will all notice a lot of the time the toxins and the difficulties start to come out. And those toxins, as they come out, if you really pay attention and take responsibility, if you're starting to feel, as say, anxious or irritated in the presence of people who are loving and supporting, that means that the irritation, the anger, the anxiousness is part of what's clearing. So instead of reacting to it and trying to ignore it and run away from it, if you just notice it, notice where it is, surround it in health and wait, it'll build to the point where it clears and you'll feel good again. But this is that stick to itiveness and patience and perseverance that we need. So what else can I say about that, about karma? So you can sort of see that to understand responsibility, we need to understand the different levels of our being. And we need to realize too that if you have a personality that's attached to all these mental, emotional and physical things and they come into contact with a fairly awakened person who's tuned into this absolute source and they know, the, often the difficulty is that the more limited consciousness tries to suppress the more aware consciousness and drag it down to its level of understanding, which is a bit like if this is the quicksand here, this mark in the bucket, and you come across a person who's attached to their problem, they will try and suck other people into that problem. So it's like if I'm healthy, let's say I'm healthy. Well, let's say I'm unhealthy. Let's say I've got the issue and I'm yucky and uncomfortable and moping and dwelling on my issue and you come along to help me and I start complaining and whinging and I try and draw you and say, oh, woe weighs me and I draw you into my suffering. If I succeed in doing that and get your sympathy, it's like you jumping in the quicksand with me and now we're both stuck in the quicksand, both of us are getting dragged down, which means I have added to my karma by drawing someone else into my problems and I've drawn you into it and you've allowed that and that's your karma by allowing yourself to get drawn into my quicksand. Whereas if you tuned into yourself and you saw that I was suffering, you would say to me, Paul, I can see that you're suffering. I can tell that you're feeling uncomfortable. You've had a really rough time of it. I'm going to stand here on the edge of the quicksand. I'm going to offer you a rope and a hand and I'm going to bring in light and love and support you and help you out. All you have to do is take my hand and take in some of this health. Let me overflow my health to you and help you out of the quicksand. Now, if you do that and that person does not want to come out of their muck, there's nothing you can do. That's their choice. But if they say, okay, if you, if you don't buy into their drama and you just make them aware that you're there for the love and support, but if they don't want to listen, you might say, all right, well, here's my phone number. You can just call me when you are ready to come out of your quicksand. If it were that simple, okay? So you go off and help everybody else. Now, eventually that person is going to get so sick and tired of sitting in their crap and no one's buying into it. They can't suck a hundred other people into the quicksand with them. It's like flies getting all trapped in the same spider web, okay? They can't trap anyone else in their network of, of, of illness. They're going to get annoyed at that. And the less people that buy into that, the more annoyed they're going to get because no one's buying into their drama. One day they get so sick of arguing, so sick of complaining, so sick of being difficult. And they look up and they say, actually, you, you're being loving, you're being supportive. You're waiting there very patient for, patiently for me to come out of my self-induced induced attachment to my issue. And they'll say, I'm ready for healing. I want some of what you've got. I can see that you're supporting me. Here's my hand, help me out. So at that point, when a person is ready, they start allowing themselves to fill up with health. They start letting go of their attachments and they start to come back into balance. That's clearing your karma. So let's just finish the talk on karma here with, um, so you grow in responsibility and you grow in awareness. And the more aware you are, the less mistakes you make because you are plugging in and owning your power. So remember, there are two, two things. It's all about win-win. You can have what's called karma of reward or karma of retribution. Okay. Now, 
sometimes people do all the right things, but like they do things to help other people, but they're not doing it for selfless reasons. They're doing it for selfish reasons. Okay. So in other words, people say, I'll do this for you, but and there'll, there'll be um there'll be a price tag associated with it, you could say. Okay, so when you do good for other people, like I say a person is helping uh helping the needy or the hungry, okay, but they're not doing it out of the love to help, they're doing it to look good in the eyes of society. So that's actually a selfish motive. So you can be doing good deeds. This is why karma has lots of different elements to it. You can be doing good deeds for rewards. That still has a karmic tag associated with it, but it'll be nice karma. So if you do good things for people, that goodness will come back to you. But the trouble is because you're attached to the reward, that itself is a karmic tag and you can't free yourself and grow in the future because it's not done for the good of all. It's win, it's sort of like, it's, it's done at a cost. And then there's karma of retribution, which means evil deeds, for example, okay? One common example of karma of reward might be in a relationship again, where you have one party who's, who tries to be very loving and very supportive, and they do all the things for you and try to make you feel comfortable. But if they don't get that themselves, if they don't get what they want when they want it, they're actually being controlling, then they fly off the deep end and they'll go into a, you know, they get really upset. And then they get even more frustrated because they think that I've done all the right things. I've been nice. I've been a good wife or a good husband, a good child or whatever it is. And I'm still, why am I so miserable? It's because of the attachment to the outcome. Okay. They're not doing it selflessly. They're doing it for a reward. And it's good to do good things, but it's the attachment that gets us into trouble. There are also other types of karma. So there's what's called group karma. So group karma is basically, because we're all cells in the body of humanity, that means if we're playing a part in society, like we're doing right now in this pandemic, for example, we're all part of humanity. We're caught in the collective. That means that the decisions made in the collective, uh, let's say the leaders in the collective are making certain decisions which aren't necessarily in our best interests. So if we buy into that, that means that we are playing a role in, in an error and that is going to have some group karmic consequences. It's not going to be as bad for us as part of the group as it is for the individuals that are spreading falsehoods or lies or manipulating or bullying but it still will create a karma of group association so that might be if you look at you know our growth over many many lifetimes that might be why you get born into some cultures where you can you collectively do work which helps support the group okay if you're involved in something which is a bit negative at some point then later on you might actually get involved to something in a great more humanitarian purpose to help rebalance the scales and do some good. So there's group karma, okay? Then there's individual karma, which is based on our own choices. And that itself has three elements to it. So the first element is there's that collective karma we've um, accumulated since our first descent into matter in, in any of our life incarnations. Since the very first time we started as a spiritual source being, spark, to all our lifetimes to our present moment. That's what you might call our collective karma, which I think it's called in the Eastern terms, let's see, Sanchita karma, human merits and demerits accumulated from previous births. Then you have Pravabda karma. There's that portion of that that we're, that influences our present life. Okay, so you could say when we come into incarnation, we decide our life purpose. So it's, in, it's, it's entwined in our life purpose because the past dictates the present, and sometimes that past action dictates our work and our line of work. So when you come into incarnation, you could say that we choose our parents and our environment to give us the best chance to both achieve our purpose and our life goal, and also to work off any old past issues that we may have accumulated in our buckets of our personality since time began. Okay, so that's in a sense, instead of blaming your parents, for example, for being born into a horrible family or a horrible environment, 
there could actually be karmic reasons why you're born into that environment. And in actual fact, from the spiritual angle, we choose our parents, they don't choose us. It's, a, it's, it's like an agreement you, you enter into. So even then, if you really had some awareness, you'd say, okay, I've obviously chosen to be here for a reason. So I'm going to choose to make the most of this and work through it and build more health so that I learn from this and I come out wiser and might be hard work, but eventually you come out the other side a wiser, more enlightened, aware person. And then there's the karma that we, we create in the moment. So in the moment, when we have an interaction with another person, if we stay nice and centered and we come out of that interaction still centered and balanced mentally, emotionally, physically and spiritually, our centers are balanced. It means we've done the best we can and whatever happens is just going to happen, win or lose. Okay. But if we lose that, that's creating an imbalance. And because a lot of people are focused on the external, and not the internal, we don't even know half the time if we're doing the right thing or not. So if you imagine a person over here attached to their faulty belief system, the mental belief system, they're not even going to be aware if that belief system is healthy or not healthy because they're not feeling it in their own being. And then it becomes a matter of opinion. And then it becomes a matter of whose opinion is more powerful. I think you should do this. You shouldn't do that. And then it's a matter of, then there's this conflict or battle. I don't want to do it. Yes, you have to do it, that sort of thing. But if people could lay that aside and tune in, they would then be able to say, is this belief system, is this thing that I'm being told I should be able to do in alignment with my own inner being? In other words, when I run the question through my spirit, mind, emotions, energy, and body, does it make me feel balanced and one and unified and connected? If it does, it means it's probably the right decision. It's probably healthy for us. And we could say, I'm going to respond to that by saying yes, because it's in alignment with my own inner conviction. But if you're getting told to do something which is manipulative and deceitful, if you tune into your own being, what will happen is if you buy into that, you'll find yourself go from balance to imbalance. And that creates disharmony and conflict in your own system because you're in conflict between your higher energy and your lower personality. Your personality is confused because it doesn't know whether to believe the other person telling you certain knowledge or to believe the innermost conviction. It's so out of touch that it can't even do that. So you have to get thinking and feeling together. Then there's the karma related to the life of the disciple. Um, also going back to individual karma. So in the moment we can choose to do something for the right reason. So you can say, for example, say, um, if you ask yourself the question, is what I'm doing a benefit to me and the other person? Is it a win-win situation? If it is, it's probably healthy. If it's a win-lose, if it's like, do I benefit at the other person's expense, the expense of their power, creativity, free will, then it's win-lose. You become, you're playing the victimizer. And there are karmic actions associated with being a victimizer because you're suppressing other people's free will. They haven't got the choice to choose a line of action in alignment with their own innermost conviction. That's free will as a fundamental universal law. If it's the reverse, if you're a pleaser, if you're a bit play the victim all the time, and you're always doing things for other people, you're draining your cup and becoming depleted. At the, to help other people, then what you're doing is it's a lose-win situation. You're being giving and loving and supporting, but everyone's taking from you and they're winning, they're feeling better, but you're feeling worse. So you've got to remember that it's like the bucket needs to be refilled. You need to fill yourself up with health, over flush out your muck, overflow the health onto other people so that everyone gets the overflow and then there's abundance and there's sharing. There's plenty of resources in the world, if we overflow our health onto others, and then there's no taking. Taking doesn't need to come into it at all. There's just sharing. And every time we share, we fill other people up. So you can, comes back to that statement, feed the health, starve the disease, overflow health. Health is just as catchy as disease. It's just that because people are focused on fear and lack and separation and divide, they're focused on conflict. They actually ripping themselves apart more and creating more disease. So they choose to take that on. That means they choose to fill themselves up with more psychological fear and trauma. 
instead of healing that trauma. But if you overflow with health, the only thing other people can catch from you is health. Okay? You flush your own muck out on the way out. You overflow health, so health muck is transmitted into more health because it's just trapped energy. That health overflows onto other people, which lifts them up to a higher vibration, which makes them more immune to illness and injury because they're more in sync. Then you've got uh, the karma of the cycle. So when a person starts to connect with themselves as a soul and they start to raise their vibrations to a higher level, they've got two types of energies they're now conscious of. The people, person who's attached to the personality only has really one sort of energy they're consciously working with, and that's personality energies. Okay? They don't even believe in this higher energy. So they don't, to them it doesn't exist. They can't, they can't see that level of vibration because it's like me living in this room. I can't see what it's like from the roof because I haven't even got there yet. Okay? But once you start to tap into that higher energy, this person who's more conscious and aware has got two types of energies playing. There's the higher, healthy ones, and the lower, lower personality ones, which may or may not, which have been doing things for good or bad reasons throughout our, our incarnation, our lifetime. And you have sometimes very good people that are still stuck as a personality, and sometimes you have very evil people that are stuck as a personality. The only difference is the people doing healthy, good things are unconsciously doing things in alignment with their higher self, whereas the people that are doing evil are consciously or unconsciously doing the opposite. They're actually manipulating and suppressing more. So that's the idea. But the point is, as you become more aware, it becomes even more acute, the disturbance, because you have you realise now that there's a healthy element, which is the life source here, and the bucket that's already full of a certain amount of muck, and then the conscious work of building in more health develops. So you can't really choose to build in more health until you are aware of the higher and the lower. Once you are, you have a choice to accept more health or and starve the disease or to hold on to those issues and block the health, react to health. And it's a really funny situation in society that a lot of people react to health negatively and accept disease. Okay, like they'll eat rotten food, but they won't eat healthy food. And they'll say that I can get away with it, but you can't. Or instead of responding to health and building it in and reacting and saying no to disease. So we have to get things in the right perspective. Then there's hierarchical karma, which is to do with the spiritual government of the planet. Then there's planetary karma, there's national karma, race karma, educational karma. Educational karma relates to the learning and expression and distribution of truths or errors. Uh, in other words, not efficient expression, misrepresentation, imposed or forced knowledge. It's got a lot to do with knowledge, okay, and the knowledge that we acquire in life. That knowledge can be very, very helpful and very, very useful when it's used in alignment with the higher self, right? But if that knowledge is used inappropriately to suppress and control and, and manipulate and omit and all that sort of stuff, the common tactics of the ego, which is about superficial short-term gain, but at long-term cost, whereas the soul is about gain for everyone short and long-term. So in other words, there is a responsibility when we're educating others to make sure we're teaching them truth and not errors. So in my field, for example, in uh, osteopathy and healing, when you teach anatomy, a simple subject like anatomy at college, you can teach anatomy in a way which adds to the understanding of the whole person and looks at the interrelationships between the various elements of anatomy and looking at the relationships and the connections. And it's all about balanced relationship, right? We get back to that energy, balanced energy and forces. Or you can teach anatomy in a very object focus, like A, B, C, D. This is a muscle, this is a joint, this is a, an organ. Or you can say, well, here's the organ. It has a nerve supply. It's surrounded by these muscles and joints. You look at the relationships. And if you start looking at the relationships, you start understanding why things are getting into trouble, not just, oh, this is a tight muscle. You understand that muscle is tight because origin and insertion are pulled apart, stretched, or because it's short and constricted. So the more context you get about the interrelationships, the easier it is to see what's really going on. And this is the same with meditation and anything in life. The more of ourselves we understand, the easier it is to make a healthy life choice and make healthy 
make decisions which are going to benefit us. So I think that's all I want to say on karma. I think what I'll finish with is a little statement. This is a quote from Alice Bailey. This is why I was suggesting the source. I'm not going to talk about anything beyond this. But in this Alice Bailey and Esoteric Healing, it says liberty, freedom in the minds of many, is freedom from the imposition of any man's rule, freedom to do as one wishes, to think as one determines, and live as one chooses. That is, as it should be, provided one's wishes, choices, thoughts, and desires are free from selfishness and dedicated to the good of the whole. This is as yet very seldom solved. So, so I'm going to use a little example here. If you have a criminal with a bad back and he comes in for a treatment to get healed, now, that criminal has a bad back. If you think about, like, from his individual perspective, he just wants to be out of pain and to get back to work. But what is his work? It's to steal and abuse society. So socially speaking, he's doing harm to society. And his back problem could be his higher self saying, I am a bit tired of you stealing and abusing other people. There's a part of him that really wants to heal, but he's stuck in his habit pattern. So it's manifesting as a back problem to stop him from doing harm to others. So if he goes to see a practitioner who just treats physically and gets his back right, you've actually help the patient feel better but you've helped the problem to function better which means you've actually helped society you've actually helped the problem in society get worse so you can sort of see from that that it's it's a it's a win for the criminal really and a loss for society it's win lose but it's not a win for the criminal because that just perpetuates his faulty habit for longer it extends the time that he has to go before he starts to wake up to his lesson if he sees a good practitioner, the practitioner might tune into his inner system and say, you know what, your system doesn't want to budge. It really is not interested in healing. So I'm going to teach you how to align and get yourself to balance, right? So you teach a person, the criminal, to come back to balance and to get him to feel what balance comes. It feels like that's educating him. Now, he might go, all right, you might not get a full healing, but you get a centering and a balancing happening. He walks out of the office feeling somewhat better, but no healings really take place. In other words, no health has come in and flushed any muck or issues out of his bucket, which is a belief that stealing is good for him. But he goes off, he feels all right, he goes back to work, and then soon, straight away he goes out of balance again. So he comes back and he says, Doctor, I've, I've, my back's playing up again. I went back to work. doesn't tell you what the work is. My back's playing up again. And you get him back to balance. You can tell he's not healing, but he's back in neutral. Okay? He goes off to work. His back starts playing up comes back in after a while by educating him what it feels like to be healthy centered he starts to notice that when he goes out to work every time he does steal something his back plays up so he starts to make the conscious link you know what i'm starting to see that that action is creating that karmic consequence now he's aware of it he starts to say you know what i'm going to stop stealing and so, sure enough as he does that his back starts to stabilize and become healthy so that's an example. So that, that concept of centering versus healing. Okay, Healing is when you're actually clearing the underlying issue and flushing muck out of your bucket. Centering is just bringing everything to neutral so that you can see clearer what the issue is. Now, if you just heal people or balance people without teaching them how to heal, that criminal never becomes conscious that he's making a mistake. Okay. You haven't told him he's made a mistake. You're just bringing him back to neutral. He starts to, of his own free will, realize that and starts to align himself. Okay? So that's a bit of an example summarizing everything I'm good at. But also, if you analyze that, if you do something which is really free and liberates you from life, frees you from karmic attachments, it's going to benefit you, it's going to benefit society, it's going to benefit the planet. If you can tick all those boxes, that's probably a good action. Okay, good thing to do. But Alice Bailey goes on and says, liberation is more than all of this. It's freedom from the past. That's from our past traumas, our past reaction patterns, our past. You can let all that go and just live in the moment. Freedom. Freedom to move forward along certain predetermined lines, which is basically our sole purpose, our purpose for being. Freedom to express all the divinity which we're capable of as an individual or which a nation can present to the world. And when you do something from the right place, it respects free will, it respects the other person, it 
doesn't have to bully, coerce, manipulate, and make you do something against your will. It allows you the freedom to go within, align yourself, and stay centered and tuned in. So I'm going to leave our talk there. I hope you enjoyed that.